In the past, it has destroyed civilizations. Today, it causes misery for millions. And in the future, it could cause social disruption on a scale we have never seen before. Hello, I'm David Nussbaum, the Chief Executive of WWF, and I'm talking about water, or to be more specific, the lack of it. We're facing a big problem, but I'm hoping that together we can tackle it. Whether it's global food security, conflict and forced migration, energy or economic growth, water is right at the heart of the challenges that we face in this century. Unless we come up with some dramatic solutions, and soon, by 2050, over 7 billion people, that's more than the entire population of the planet today, could be living with chronic water scarcity. We live on a blue planet, a world of life and water. But nearly all of that is seawater. Only 3% is freshwater, and 99% of that is locked up in glaciers, ice and deep underground aquifers. But that tiny remaining percentage is an indispensable resource without which no life is possible. We couldn't be here. Years ago, lack of water killed off the Harappa civilization of the Indus Valley, the Akkadians of the Middle East, the Angkor of Southeast Asia and the Mayans of Central America. It could happen again to us. The evidence is all around us. Take the Aral. The Aral Sea is, or rather was, the fourth largest freshwater lake in the world. But during the Soviet era, the rivers that fed it were diverted to irrigate arid farmland for growing cotton. The result? By 2004, its surface area had shrunk by 90%. And the once mighty Rio Grande made famous by John Wayne, is just a shadow, just a trickle of its former self. Long stretches are completely dry. It's not difficult to guess why our rivers are running dry. It's because we've been taking too much water out of them for too long. Humanity uses an estimated 2,000 cubic kilometres of water per year. That's two quadrillion litres and all out of that tiny proportion of fresh water available to us. The most obvious use is at home, for drinking, washing and flushing the loo. But in fact, this represents only 10% of the water we consume globally. Industry accounts for about 20% and is also responsible for enormous quantities of pollution. And remember, total industrial water use is expected to increase dramatically in the coming years. But the biggest user of all is agriculture, consuming nearly 70% of the world's fresh water supply so that we can eat. Indeed, irrigation-fed agriculture produces nearly half the world's food supply. Without it, we could not feed our planet's population of over 6 billion people. So where does all this water come from? This remarkable image is a satellite photo of the River Indus in Pakistan the world's largest connected irrigation system. Irrigation has literally made the desert bloom. The food supplies, livelihoods and economy of Pakistan's 160 million people depend entirely on the crops made possible through this irrigation. But in recent years, this once mighty river has almost completely stopped flowing to the sea because of the amount of water taken out for irrigation. The consequences have been profound. Wide-ranging damage to the natural systems that depend on the river flowing. And tragically, saltwater intrusion into thousands of communities, destroying drinking water and devastating farming lands. Huge numbers have been forced to migrate, and violent conflict is frequent. The Indus River shows us what happens when we mismanage our voracious appetite for water without regard for the consequences. This is causing increasing insecurity and threatens our global food supplies. This picture gives us a clear sense of the challenge we face. It shows in colour those areas where a high percentage of the available surface water is being used each year, with those areas in red where we already use up to or more than 100% of the total surface water availability. It clearly shows the most critical points in the global water crisis. 
However, this image is somewhat misleading. To understand the crisis, we need to focus more carefully. Two-thirds of the world's population, over four billion people, live between these lines. It is where demand for water is rising most rapidly and where most of our food is produced. This graph illustrates the trend in total water withdrawals and estimates for the future. Between 1990 and 2050, global water use is predicted to increase by 40%. Some suggest then that in the 21st century, major wars will be fought not over oil, but over water. Perhaps, or perhaps not, we already live in a world where violent local conflict over access to water resources is endemic. World food shortages have led to soaring prices and food riots in over 40 countries. This is what the world water crisis really means. As well as the threat to humans, there is the plight of the natural world. If the forests are the planet's lungs, rivers are its blood supply. And an extraordinary one-third of global vertebrate species live in or on the river. But 50% of the world's wetlands have been destroyed and freshwater species are disappearing faster than any other group. Tackling this crisis is as urgent and as profound as meeting the crisis facing our tropical forests. To add to these problems, climate change will make things worse. As a consequence, we must brace ourselves for flood and drought that will happen more often and with greater intensity. It's not a pretty picture. But, and it's a very big but, we probably do have enough water to sustain our needs and the needs of the natural world, both now and into the future. This is the total amount of water available to us globally, clearly showing an uneven distribution. Some areas of the planet have enormous supplies of fresh water, for example the Congo and the Amazon. In other areas, water is extremely scarce. South India, the Mediterranean or the Western United States. Fundamentally, therefore, water is local. And although requiring concerted global action, the solutions must also be local. So then, what are the answers? Let's start with you and with me. Come on. Every day, I use about 150 litres of water for drinking, washing and, as you saw, flushing the loo. But there's more than that. Take breakfast. Perhaps it's time for a bowl of cereal. But to grow that wheat took 200 litres of water. Now lunch. Perhaps a bean curry and some rice. 400 litres to make that. And after work, maybe it's time for a beer. But making that took another 75 litres of water. And then supper. A burger. That takes a whopping 2,400 litres of water. Think cows and cattle feed. But then, what about this cotton shirt I'm wearing? That took 3,000 litres of water to grow the cotton and make the shirt. The trousers, another 12,000 litres. And as for the shoes, 8,000 litres. That's a huge 30,000 litres of water already. But it needs more than just us. Let's start with government. First, we need to ensure that our requirement for water does not destroy the very streams and rivers we need so desperately. This means we have to have laws already on the books in places like Kenya, South Africa and Mexico and planned elsewhere. A global treaty enshrining such agreements in international law has already been approved by the UN General Assembly and is now awaiting ratification by the governments of member states. Now, in relation to dams, governments must establish clear rules for the siting, construction and operation of dams so that the next generation of hydroelectric power works in harmony with the natural flow and rhythm of our rivers. And what can we ask of business? It needs to be aware not just of its carbon footprint, 
but also its water footprint and use all its ingenuity to limit the amount of water it takes from natural systems for industry and to feed us. It can do this by increasing the amount of rain-fed agriculture, reducing the need for irrigation and irrigating more efficiently. Businesses must develop ways to increase production while reducing their impact on freshwater systems. Equally important, business must show leadership in supporting and advocating for government reforms in the way we manage water. Finally, underlying all these, and without which none is possible, is the need for strong, well-resourced and politically independent institutions to help ensure that our water and our rivers are well managed and the interests of the marginalised and the natural world protected. Think about it. Together, we can make a difference. <laughs>